Hi, I'm Meta Spencer, and today we're going to Mexico City for one thing, and we're going to Montreal, and we may go to Geneva. So, but I'm not so sure because the Geneva guy hasn't shown up yet. This is a schmooze day. Some of you may know that on schmooze days, I don't have an agenda. So I never know what people are going to talk about. I just put together some interesting people that I think should know each other and uh, try to put them together and see what happens. So uh, today, what we have, uh, you will uh, have an opportunity to meet Aaron Tovish, who's just joined us. He's in Mexico City in the Swedish embassy to Mexico, because his wife is the ambassador to, to Mexico. And he is a retired coordinator for Mayors for Peace, who uh, was, that outfit was based in Hiroshima. In uh, Montreal is uh, Abraham Weisfeld, uh, who is a, a Montrealer, who is Jewish, and, but he's anti-Zionist. He's a big time activist who lives Normally, he lives half of the year, and maybe he's going to start living year-round in Nablus, Palestine. Doug Saunders is, uh, you will probably all recognize him if you've been on watching this show before, because he seems to, uh, he likes these uh, schmooze days. He is the international affairs uh, honcho at the Globe and Mail. Uh, spends a lot of time in Germany, but I guess uh, you're going to go back sometime soon for another stint at that institute, right, Doug? Hopefully get a few more months of think tanking in uh, later this year and spend some time in some other countries in the vicinity too, in Russia and uh, Sweden and Spain. I consider Doug sort of like the co-host for this show because he's always got wonderful things that he brings up to talk about. So why don't we see what's on your mind, Doug? What, what would you like for these guys to to discuss. So it's it's a little hard to avoid uh, being a little curious about uh, what's going on in terms of lack of peace in Palestine right now. Uh, Abraham, what do you, I mean, what are you hearing in Nablus? You know, access to Palestine is, uh, is not possible because uh, the pandemic is still raging in, in the West Bank and Gaza because Israel didn't consider itself to be responsible are vaccinating the population there, even though they have, you know, three million doses of the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine in stock, is that this uh, war on Gaza was essentially ordered by somebody who's not even the prime minister anymore. Netanyahu, you know, has expired his mandate from the president to form a government. So he cannot be a prime minister. He is not presently the prime minister. And yet he ordered a war in Gaza. You know, <laughs> you know, Israel is a sort of a weird country. You know, and that's just one example of uh, <clears throat> how bad it can get. Let me ask you about the the electoral politics behind this, because March was supposed to be a big month. March March had an election in Israel that failed to produce a government, um, and as you point out, means that there's somebody acting as prime minister who doesn't have legitimacy as prime minister. But March, of course, was also supposed to have the first Palestinian election since 2006, um, which I think people had optimistically hoped would produce a shift away from Hamas uh, and into Fatah. Um, and it, they may yet happen and so on. But has, has this attack uh, by Israel caused a shift of sentiments? Um, yes. Yeah. Definitely, you know, uh, the Palestinian election for the legislative authority <clears throat> was supposed to have taken place two days ago, but it was su suspended by the president, uh, Abbas, uh, seems to have uh, sole authority in the Palestinian authority. Uh, and uh, his strategy was that he was making a point out of uh, getting the uh, right to have to conduct the election in West Jerusalem and thereby uh, put a stake in the, in the ground, you know, to uh, claim East uh, Jerusalem as part of the uh, Palestine that was designated by the Oslo Interim Agreement. And this was going to make him out to be a big hero because he eventually he expected to win the case against Israel. 
even though Israel was in effect allowing the election to go ahead, but not allowing the election ballot boxes to be placed in the post offices. And therefore, they could have been placed in Palestinian banks or, or in other Palestinian establishments, or Palestinians could have just <coughs> drove down to uh, the uh, suburbs there to go and vote in the uh, Pal Palestinian uh, office. So Abbas was trying to make you know, a big deal out of this, uh, more of a big deal than it was. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, you know, use the uh, the ultimate option of uh, suspending the election in order to make the point. But uh, you know, he's trying to write on the back of the uh, popular uprising that was conducted by the youth, the Shabab, as they're called, at the Damascus Gate, where previously there was you know free uh, <coughs> free transit, you know, free free use of the uh, of the entranceway by the Palestinians, but. Uh, the uh, Zionist authorities, the military, the police in particular, uh, who are rather aggressive, even more aggressive than the military, you know, are trying to expel the Palestinian youth from congregating in that area. And the boss was trying to ride on that, you know, Shabab movement. But it didn't work because Hamas decided to, to jump on top of the horse as well and made a bigger deal out of the matter by coming to the support of the of the Palestinian youth at the Damascus Gate <clears throat> and the residents of Sheikh Jarrah by uh, launching a counterattack using uh, mortars, which are not rockets, don't have an explosive charge, don't have a guidance system, but nonetheless are treated as such and used as an excuse by Netanyahu to jump on the horse himself and ride you know, to, <clears throat> to the authority that he assumes. And uh, resulted in like 253 casualties in uh, the Gaza, and uh, what is it, uh, 50 50,000 people who are now uh, uh, refugees again uh, in Gaza because their homes have been destroyed. Together with the pilots who decide to take revenge on the journalists by bombing the uh, journalists' uh, tower there, together with the radio station antennas. And uh, the uh, servers for the internet service in Gaza Strip were also bombed, as well as uh, other infrastructure. So Israel was trying to degrade the political authority of Hamas and its operating capability in its uh, own campaign. So there's a lot of uh, uh, opportunistic interests that are in play here. Which all of which disregards, you know, the civilian population of Palestinians. I am curious about how much, if any, well, I think there is some shift in the public opinion globally, but uh, it's really the U.S., of course, that's most important in, uh, in that uh, the U.S. has been so, so supportive of, of the Israeli position up till now. But I certainly hear evidence that there is a change of opinion in the U.S., and I just don't know whether it's enough to make any difference and whether it's reflected globally. Is there, is there any additional movement, for example, in Mexico? Um, yeah. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, make a comment uh, based on my experience of working for 14 years with an international network of cities. And uh, that is that... Um, the what international law says about attacking uh, civilian populations and uh, densely populated areas um, is being um, pretty regularly violated. Uh, there's an international campaign against the use of wide area explosives in populated areas, which is doing very good work within the UN system among experts and so on but it's not getting much attention internationally. And then, uh, if Doug will uh, forgive me, uh, I think that the media handles this issue of cities coming under bombardment, be it by Hamas or, or the Israeli Air Force, um, uh, handles it very badly. Um, there's nothing like uh, for a great visual opening of a news report to show a big billowing, fiery um, ball of smoke 
rising up above, uh, you know, a, an urban neighborhood um, or uh, big buildings burning and so forth. Um, and it's rarely, if ever, uh, said that this is a war crime. What's, what's happening with this kind of warfare is criminal. Uh, when I worked for Mayors for Peace, um, we became pretty consistent at condemning uh, attacks of this sort, regardless of the source, regardless of the supposed justifications. Um, and uh, the United Cities and local governments also picked up on this. But I haven't seen it happening so consistently lately or the media simply being negligent about reporting these opinions of uh, city leaders from all over the world. Um, and so, Doug, I challenge you <laughs> to talk to some of the leading uh, members of Mayors for Peace and uh, United Cities and Local Governments, which is uh, um, headquartered in Barcelona, Spain, um, to get reactions from them and um, how they feel when they turn on the TV and see these kind of explosions occurring and the commentators say nothing about um, the legality or illegality of, of um, such attacks. Getting mayor's views is certainly a good idea. I mean, I would say the illegality of the attacks was the main subject of the reporting last week. Um, and uh, uh, tended to dominate uh, uh, the coverage. I mean, I mean, the, the fact that the fact that it violated uh, both international agreements and and sort of uh, uh, international law was was the outstanding fact about the Israeli response. Well, I, I noticed an uptick in that when the Associated Press and Newsweek and I forget a few others actually they themselves came under attack. And of course, it's particularly egregious when, when the media is attacked, as for example, happened when NATO attacked in Belgrade. Um, but uh, while I take your point that it's mentioned, um, I don't think that you're hearing it from city leaders and that um, city leaders internationally are very concerned about the low level of respect that's uh, given to a, a really a, a central part of international law. Yeah, it's partly because I think I think the 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 com the, um, the comparison of scale is a difficult one, in that municipal leaders do have strong voices in these things. Part of the problem, of course, is that in Gaza there isn't such a thing as a municipal layer. It's it's it still does not have a legitimate uh, uh, government. It's a it's an area under Israeli military control, um, and so you don't you don't have that type of voice, that scale of government uh, uh, on on the Palestinian side, at least not in Gaza. Um, West Bank's another matter as, as, as far as the structure of government. So what about the mayor of it's, an, it's an interesting idea. You, it, it, it would be, it'd be worth hearing a statement from mayors. Yeah. Can you get a statement from mayors, at Aaron? <clears throat> well, I haven't worked for mayors for peace for uh, four years now. I know, uh, but, but um, you, they know who you're, yeah. who you are. <laughs> yeah, no, I could, uh, I could put the challenge to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and uh, some of the other leading cities. And I could bring it up uh, with um, uh, Claudia Scheinbaum, the mayor of, uh, or governor of Mexico City. Hmm, okay. And then Amy, what would you do with that if you had a new uh, list of protesters, like 6,000 cities all against what the uh, Israelis yeah, are doing to Gaza? <laughs> How, where would you go with that? There, there are about 6,000 cities in Mayors for Peace, aren't there? Over 7,000. 7,000. Okay, there you go. Okay, we'll get, we'll, we'll get 7,000 protests for you, Amy. What are you going to do with that? That would have an effect upon the undecided uh, Jewish uh, opinion 
uh, it should be known that uh, there's a, a great deal of uh, dissident opinion that is now going mainstream, you know, in the uh, <coughs> Jewish and nationalities of various countries against the, the uh, you know, policies of the uh, governments of Israel. And uh, uh, I'd like to uh, point out to one particular example, a journalist uh, by the name of Peter Beinart, yeah. who writes for Jewish Currents and uh, writes for the Jewish Forward in New York City as well, who is a mainstream journalist and previously was a pro-Zionist, has now come out with the right of return of the Palestinian refugees. Yeah, he's on every TV show you turn on. He's well, I th and I think the I think the essay that Abraham references, which was in Jewish Currents, which is a, a important magazine that that he's uh, on the editorial board of, was an influence, although maybe not in the way necessarily. It it it, 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 it has a different influence in different ways because, of course, he pointed out that the two state solution is politically harder to imagine after a decade of Netanyahu expanding settlements and so on, um, and pointed out that there's no way you could have a sustainable one state solution that would be recognizable in international law and moral without rec giving Palestinians an equal right of return as Israeli Jews have. And, and he quite eloquently pointed out that they're both populations that are that are that are connected to a historic memory of displacement and 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 that that, that multi generational sense of displacement is central to to national identity in both Palestine and Israel. Um, but for some people, that would be read as being an an argument about how you could make a one state solution work. But I think for a lot of people, and I said this in my column on this topic last week, that um, I think. For a lot of Israeli readers, uh, that that essay would would be read as being making the case of why a one state solution is impossible, <laughs> and and why uh, why why it's it's why the abandoning the the uh, the Middle East peace process or whatever ruins of it still exist at uh, at this point would still would still be the worst option because you would have to consider things like having a parallel and equal right of return. And uh, yeah, it is. I would like to agree with Doug there that uh, <clears throat> the right of return basically makes a, a one state solution unfeasible. And uh, the one state uh, campaign or the one state movement, there are two actually uh, blocks of supporters there, <clears throat> both of them ignore the right of return of the Palestinian refugees, which uh, makes uh, the one state solution uh, not a solution. Uh, on the other hand, the two state solution is not feasible in the sense of two sovereign states. Both of these proposed solutions are not solutions. And yet uh, both camps tend to ignore, you know, the, uh, the impasse. They just, you know, focus on the points that make their option somewhat better than the alternative option that is considered. So <clears throat> uh, one has to question the whole constitutional nature of the state itself because it leads to <clears throat> an impossible solution on either the one hand or the other. So one has to go into a... Uh, um, uh, or sort of an academic research, you know, uh, uh, goal of finding an alternative that goes beyond the alternatives that have been presented. Well, a, plan A doesn't work, plan D, B doesn't work, and you have plan C. Is that it? So over the three years that I was writing, you know, uh, at Nab in Nablus, when I was living in Nablus, I had to figure out, you know, some other solution. And this is provided to me by the concept that I have inherent in my own sort of uh, political upbringing, since my mother was a Jewish Bundes anti-Zionist from Warsaw, who taught me, and the Bund taught us that the national cultural autonomy is a necessary concept to, for minority nationalities to have representation in the constitutional provisions of the, the country in which they're living. 
So if one takes national cultural autonomy and applies it in a generalized fashion to both parties and to all parties concerned, one you know, ends up with a, a federated society, a civil society that is independent of the state. And I elaborated this and explained how it can be done. Uh, I haven't mentioned previously that I have a certain diplomatic uh, qualification because I was the charge d'affaires for the Palestine ambassador to Canada between 1982 and 1985 during the uh, Israel invasion of Lebanon. So I have a certain. Wait a minute! You, 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 they know your idea. You, you, you had a, an opportunity to, to, uh, to try to try it out on him, and what did he say? Uh, I don't know if Abdullah Abdullah has had the time to read the book yet, but uh, when I <laughs> make my proposals, uh, they're uh, treated as legitimate and not, you know, as. Uh, something that is, uh, uh, you know, an impossibility. Well, I, so, I never heard of anybody but you promote, promote such a thing. So, I, I mean, you're well, gonna yeah, have, either we're going to talk about it or we're not going to talk about it. If we're going to talk about it, you've got to explain a lot because it's not something anybody else has ever heard of. Well, start with a nutshell. <laughs> what's, what's the proposal in a nutshell? Okay. Now, each population which has a, their own national identity, of course, have the right to their own uh, national uh, representation. And so they would uh, elect their own government. You know, there would you know, be a, a Jewish government and there would be a Palestinian government and there would be Jewish people living, uh, uh, you know, uh, amongst the uh, Palestinians uh, uh, or living in uh, mostly uh, Jewish uh, municipalities such as Tel Aviv, which would have their own municipal government as well, and thus give, you know, a certain <clears throat> uh, identity, uh, you know, governmental identity to the Jewish uh, and national identity in, in such a case on a municipal level, in addition to a governmental uh, representation over the entire territory. This would allow for the return of the refugees, which would make the Palestinians the majority. Now, in a one-state solution, um, who, you know, if the question of the return of the Palestinian refugees were to come up, uh, according to liberal democratic theory, you know, majority would decide the matter. However, you know, the majority would be rather slim in either one case or the other. You know, either the, uh, the Jewish you know, votes would determine that the, the Palestinians don't have a right of return, or if the Palestinians decided by a slim majority that the Palestinian refugees did have a right of return, this would, you know, obviously break out into a civil war. It's not a solution in and of itself. So how to bring about the right of return of the Palestinian refugees from now number seven and a half million, whether they return or not, nonetheless, they would be granted citizenship and a vote. So how to achieve this would have to be uh, based upon the uh, principle of uh, the national cultural autonomy. And so there would be governmental independence for the Palestinians, governmental independence for the Jewish Israelis, who are a Hebrew nation, and uh, be a federal council in which uh, each would uh, have to have, uh, you know, uh, I would, I assume there would have to be, you know, 50-50 representation in the federal council in which, you know, both one uh, and the other, you know, would have a veto power over any fundamental change in that, in that configuration. Then there would have to be constitutional assemblies for each national, grouping, and then a constitutional assembly to determine a federal constitution as well. So it's a whole process that I've outlined, you know, with uh, constitutional provisions, with reference to Resolution 181, which allows for such a procedure, which has been outlined by Dr. Uri Davis, who lives in Ramallah, and who is a Jewish Palestinian, who is actually on the political commission of the uh, Fatah Council. He's a member of Fatah, as well as Rabbi uh, Moshe Hirsch from the Turikarta, who's also uh, in the executive, he's an executive member of the Fatah Council, Fatah Party. So you can see that the process has already gained, you know, some headway uh, amongst those, you know, who are both Jewish and Palestinians, but who are anti-Zionist. So, so, the, so in short, you're, it, 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 this is interesting. It's a proposal to have two sovereign nation states defined by ethnic identity, but without any territorial basis. 
Yes. You know what it sounds like to me? I can't help thinking of the millet system in the Ottoman Empire. I can't help thinking of that. Is it? I know you don't like the idea, but isn't it similar, really? No, because the Jewish people didn't have any government in the millet system. They had only uh, a protected status as a national minority, recognized as such, had to pay a special tax, and were not uh, eligible to uh, have uh, uh, military service, you know. So they had no capacity for self-defense, supposedly defended by the state and paid for that defense, you know, by the special tax, which uh, ended up not defending them. And there were various riots uh, propagated against the Jewish community, which has nothing compared to the Holocaust, you know, by the Christians of Europe, but nonetheless, you know, didn't offer sufficient protection for the Jewish people, who therefore... Uh, found it uh, an, attack, an attractive proposition when invited by the Zionists to go to Palestine, and they did so until uh, they they actually formed 70% of the Jewish Israeli population at one point until the Russian Jewish population immigrated in a number of 2 million. And now the uh, <coughs> uh, Jewish uh, Arabs, as they should be known as, have formed 50% of the Israeli Jewish population, which is nonetheless dominated by the Ashkenazi uh, uh, so-called white uh, population of Europe who formed the core of the Zionist movement. So, you know, it gets more and more complicated as we go along. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, Mizrahi Svardim, uh, Jewish Arab population, should also have their Jewish national cultural autonomy and have their own governmental apparatus to deal with the Ashkenazi domination to which they are subjected to. So it's a little bit more like uh, some of the proposals for indigenous First Nations uh, sovereignty in places like Canada, which which would be uh, an an ethnic identity defined sovereignty with some territory, but across across a, a wide territorial space. Well, was that one of the th- was that one of the things you looked at or talked talked to in the in the process of? Um... It's not the same because uh, well, one uh, ethnic means national, uh, uh, but uh, the term national is avoided, you know, because the term nation is reserved for uh, states and uh, nation states, which is only uh, endemic, you know, to uh, liberal uh, democratic theory, but it is not necessarily representative of the actuality. So. Uh, you know, the national minorities are actually uh, called nationalities. And ethnic, ethnies, or ethnic uh, minority is only uh, used to avoid, you know, the uh, political recognition that such people are a, a national entity and are living as nationalities within a majoritarian society. So, first of all, there's that. If we can set aside uh, the question of whether there are precedents or similarities elsewhere. Uh, I'm trying to look at this from a practical point of view. And it seems to me that in the current uh, heated political uh, atmosphere, um, thoughtful ideas like yours uh, don't stand a chance. And the the major uh, uh, actors, be it Netanyahu or Hamas leaders, um, uh, would be quite hostile uh, to, to any... Um, serious exploration of this. And so what I'm wondering is whether there could be created a, um, a neutral space where um, people from all the relevant sides could be brought together, shielded from the current, you know, brouhaha, and allowed to work on this in a thoughtful way, uh, but a deliberate way, um, and at the right moment, um, come forward with Plan C. Precisely, that's a constitutional assembly. That's what a constitutional assembly would accomplish. So, uh, uh, but, you know, when uh, I presented my book, uh, and it's titled basically the Federation of Palestinian and Hebrew Nations. When I presented that to the Palestinians, all the Palestinians that I spoke to about it agreed immediately. So from the bottom up, it's feasible. Of course, those uh, political actors who are representative of a given nation state are not going to agree because it contradicts their 
their own power base. So they can be ignored. <laughs> under, under your proposal, what would happen to the current physical territorial space of Israel-Palestine? That's the second point I wanted to make, Doug, is that uh, such a national identity is not associated with a given territory, as in the case of the indigenous nations of Canada, which have been recognized in particular by Quebec and British Columbia. So there can be a concept of national cultural territorial autonomy applied as well, in particular to the black nation in the United States, to those territories in which the uh, black people are a majority. This can become an autonomous territorial entity in a future uh, uh, reconfiguration of the American Constituent uh, Assembly. However, in this case, uh, the only sort of, you know, separations of populations that one can point to in Palestine are the northern regions of uh, Israel, where there's a majority Palestinian population, and in Tel Aviv, where there's a majority, you know, Jewish population. All the rest is mixed. And the uh, Palestinian refugees could return to those territories in which they had been residents previously, which are not populated by the Jewish Israeli population, because 80% of the Jewish Israeli population is congregated around Tel Aviv and its suburbs. So and, well even even then isn't that's changing fast too, isn't it? I mean northern Tel Aviv is is uh, is pretty Arab and Muslim at this point, isn't it? I don't know. Yeah. I don't I don't I'm I know more about either. Palestine than I knew of, than I know about Israel actually because yeah. that's where I've lived, you know, for many years. Uh, for half the year in each case. And I first started going to Palestine in 2003 after Rochelle Khoury was killed. And I worked with the uh, International Solidarity Movement in the Bulata refugee camp. When at that time, you know, uh, there was this complete occupation, military occupation under the Prime Minister Sharon, who was supposedly not allowed to be a prime minister by the uh, commission of inquiry that investigated the uh, massacre that he organized in the Sabra Shatila refugee camp in Lebanon. At that time, in Nablus, uh, you know, the, there were blockades, you know, set up by the military to not to allow uh, transit, you know, over the main Jerusalem Street, you know, uh, thoroughfare, you know, in the city. The uh, refugee camp of Lada had its market street, you know, blocked off on either end, you know, by big, uh, you know, uh, mounds of earth and stones that were placed there by the military. And we went out and we, we took these uh, obstructions down. And this was followed through by the mayor of Nablus, who took away the, the main blockage there on the uh, Jerusalem Street. So uh, we make progress. And, and this, all of this, you know, like on the ground, you know, work that I've been doing and that others have been doing. Uh, and, and together with the Israeli opposition, together with the Jewish opposition in North America, which is now quite prominent, the Jewish uh, Voice for Peace in particular, uh, not in our name, uh, Ben the Ark. Uh, 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 and the others. There's so many, you know, like Jewish, you know, activist organizations now, which are not Zionist, Jewish Voices for Peace, which has now proclaimed itself to be anti-Zionist, who would be very um, amenable to such a federation, and they were considered to be a solution. However, it's very difficult to get through uh, some of the blockages. Uh, I should mention there's been a, a recent division, uh, organizational division, in the Jewish opposition movement between those who uh, accept the Zionist definition of Israel as being a Jewish nation state, who accept the Betzlam and the Human Rights Watch designation of Jewish supremacy, who accept uh, the, uh, 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 the other sort of, you know, uses of the, of the uh, national uh, definition of Jewish, and uh, the tendency which I represent, which is the Jewish Blenheim's tendency, which considers Jewishness not to be synonymous with a Zionism and Israel. So, so we refuse to accept the notion of a, a Jewish nation state. We do not consider Israel to be a Jewish nation state. We consider it to be a Zionist uh, state, which happens to be Jewish because some people are, some Jewish people are Zionist. But to call it a Jewish nation state is an uh, ideological proposition, which we do not agree with, we do not accept. We do not accept the designation that this is Jewish apartheid. We do not accept the uh, term Jewish supremacy. Uh, we consider such a uh, designation to be uh, essentially anti-Semitic. 
because it is blaming the Jewish people for what Zionism has done. Even though a majority of Jewish people don't live in Israel, a majority of people uh, <coughs> consequently uh, do not have a vote in the Jewish in the uh, Israel elections that are called Jewish. So yet we're, con we're sort of considered to be obliged to follow the government of Israel and whatever it does. <coughs> we're supposed to defend whatever the government of Israel does. <coughs> We do not accept this. So we are splitting from the Jewish opposition that, that continu continues to attack Zionism as if it were Jewish. This is a very serious division of opinion. And so I have split <coughs> from the uh, Jews who speak out list and, and uh, Stan Heller, who has the, uh, the struggle uh, cable TV news network in uh, Connecticut and New York. And uh, it's a serious, you know, weakening of the Jewish opposition. But I consider it to be a necessary division of, that uh, has to uh, <clears throat> uphold uh, the defense of the Jewish national identity and the oppression of the Jewish people, which continues and which is now being used by those uh, anti-Zionists who consider Zionism to be essentially Jewish and who therefore attack Jewish people as such. This Amy, we oppose. Amy, how many people do you think agree with you uh one tenth of one percent of all jews or what well no there have been polls that have been conducted now which indicate that uh, 43 percent of the jewish israeli population are opposed to the occupation and the majority of the jewish americans are opposed to the occupation so basically that's uh, opposition to zionism whether it identifies itself as such or not would so, it be fair to call your proposal a dual state solution? No, I avoid the term state because state, you know, uh, is associated with the concept of sovereignty. Well, I, I, I use singular, dual state solution. It can, cannot be a state if, the, if both nations are recognized. And if uh, each nation recognizes the other, they cannot have a common state. It has to be a federal system. Because who, cannot, who, what would the UN call it? A country or what? A country, yes, of course, a country. But it's, it wouldn't be a state, it would be a federation. Now, there's some indications on how to use the term from Rousseau, but. But Rousseau the, is, the UN doesn't have any such thing, right? I mean, you'd have to invent a new critter. Okay, the UN has recognized Palestine as a state, an observer state. It sits as an observer state in the General Assembly. So there's a contradiction in the structure well, of the nations, obviously. And, and, and to, to, be, state concept. to be fair, the UN created the sovereign states of Israel and Palestine in 1947. And, uh, uh, and I'm, it, I'm, always, it, it, I'm always interested to hear creative ideas of, of getting beyond the Westphalian notion of the nation state. So I, 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 enjoy, I enjoy the thought exercises of, of this type of speculation. It's, it's hard to imagine any existing sovereign state um, canceling itself. Um, we've had, uh, or the UN wanting to go back on the resolutions that it's, that it's, uh, that it's back for 80 years. I mean, we've had three periods in the last century when the United Nations or the international community have agreed to create an, a sovereign nation state in order to protect a specific population from pending genocide, which is the creation of Armenia, the creation of Israel, and the creation of Kosovo. Um, and all three, all three have been difficult because they, uh, they were nations created and internationally recognized in places that have multi-ethnic, multi-religious populations. And protecting, protecting the other populations in Armenia, Israel, and Kosovo has been more difficult. And of course, in the case of Israel-Palestine, the agreement from 1947 was to create two parallel states with Jerusalem as a shared capital. And that remains international law um 
what you're suggesting is interesting because it provides a framework. If I hate, I hate to say this, but idealistic proposals are often more useful from the perspective of pragmatists in terms of being able to shift the dial in a certain direction. Um, and does your, does your proposal, if it were to gain more air, would it inadvertently help justify the huge expansion of Israeli settlement, Jewish settlements during the last uh, 10 or 15 years? Um, the reversal of which, which was done to a much lesser extent in Gaza in 2005, the reversal of which would require an acknowledgement of the continued international law recognition of two sovereign states as a beginning negotiating point. Do you worry that if your, if your thinking were to gain ground, it would help justify the continued presence of those settlements? I, I, I wonder if, if moving okay. away from a two-state yeah. view of things would remove the impetus for future Israeli governments to retreat from settlements as a, as a beginning point toward negotiating uh, a renewed peace process. Uh, the settlements are not a, an impediment to such a solution in and of itself, with, and a solution which I call the no state solution. Okay, there's one state, two state solution. So now we have you know a no state solution available, <clears throat> and in view of the bankruptcy of the first two propositions, it lends credence to the third proposition, the no-state solution. Now, considering this in a general universal format, the United Nations has 194 states members, member states, okay. But sociologically speaking, there are 3,000 nations in the world. So there's a basic contradiction here. The logical consequence of the nation-state concept and its sovereignty is that each sovereign nation state that exists now, all will have to be divided into their own constituent nation states in order to represent the nationalities that are represented there, therein, if that pattern is to be followed. And so there would be a never ending division of nation states into further nation states. So logically, it doesn't hold and eventually will have to be overcome. Now to overcome it, one implements the Bundes concept of national cultural autonomy. And this was developed uh, by necessity because you know, the Jewish nationality was, was always you know, existing as a minority and always uh, treated you know, with the disdain you know, by the various nation states in which it existed. And so the solution was, uh, and also the Jewish people living in those states you know, considered those countries to be their homeland. Like my parents considered themselves to be Polish and Poland was their homeland. Russian Jewish people who were Russian. Canadians who are Jewish are also Canadians, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you represent you know, this consciousness, which is the ultimate determinant? And the only way to do so is national cultural autonomy. So <clears throat> you have a constituent assembly which remodels uh, every given state you know, to be representative of its constituent population by implementing national cultural autonomy. So it is not merely speculation. It is not merely a theoretical proposition. It is. It becomes a necessity after a while, and, uh, and we all know that the, this, uh, you know, provides us. This is a certain inevitability as a result. So I would uh, defend my proposition on that basis. In addition to the fact that the Palestinians are agreeable to such a proposition, the the settlements that have been implanted in the West Bank would have to respect, you know, to the law. What does the law say? Well, the law says that title deed, you know, holds. So that all the Palestinians that I interviewed that had title deed from the Ottoman Empire that I, you know, did a video Zoom in my interviews, you know, with on their documentation proves that they are the owners of various, you know, pockets of land that have been taken over by the settlements and they would have to be restored on the basis of law. Now, uh, those uh, uh, lands that do not have, you know, private Palestinian owners, therefore can be sort of, you know, claimed, you know, by settlers if uh, they're doing so in a semi-legal fashion. But those settlers who have committed crimes, 
like the settler that I saw kill a Palestinian during a demonstration in Hawara, who I videoed shooting from the back of his car because he was blocked by demonstrators. Well, that guy has to either submit, you know, to the law or go into exile. You know, he's a murderer. And other settlers who are murderers and who are members of fascist gangs that go and attack Palestinians, burn their fields, burn their olive groves, etc., committing crimes which have to be subjected to legal, uh, uh, legal consequences. And uh, Dr. Salita, the Palestinian uh, professor who examined, you know, the uh, location of the Palestinian villages that were that were uh, expelled, has concluded that it's possible to reinstitute, you know, the Palestinian villages with their inhabitants, the refugee inhabitants, in return, without dislodging the most of the uh, Jewish Israeli population. This would affect, ironically, mostly the left-wing kibbutzim of Israel, who took over the best Palestinian lands, of course. And they were the greatest criminals of all, even though uh, they uh, didn't uh, call for the expulsion of the Palestinians, they nonetheless took advantage of it. And they would be the ones to suffer most for the return of the refugees to their indigenous villages. You know, what bothers me is I, I'm an, an old fashioned liberal who have always tried to be colorblind and um, just oriented towards citizenship. And, and I've been anti-tribal as much as possible. I want to forget ethnicity. I don't want to have anything to do with ethnicity. And, and the idea of uh, building it into the system uh, really just puts me off. You're trying to reify race and ethnicity. I don't like that. There's nothing wrong with uh, your view. It's just that, it, you know, for an oppressed nationality, it's not possible. One cannot forget that one is Jewish because one is attacked for being Jewish. Right now, Jewish people are being attacked by the white supremacists, supremacists in the United States. And they're also being attacked now by the uh, anti-Zionist uh, activists, some anti-Zionist activists, who consider that they're guilty because Israel is a Jewish state, supposedly. So they consider that it's uh, uh, appropriate to attack Jewish people in order to attack, you know, have some sort of effect upon, you know, the yeah. state of Israel. Okay, but this really is, it can take us into a whole yeah. thing about this critical race theory and so on which is in a way um, building a whole uh, theoretical structure on the notion that people have inherently some sort of identity, group identity, can't get over it and, and therefore we have to uh, acknowledge it and fight uh, for our own uh, ethnic identity, et cetera. And this, this whole current debate about critical race theory uh, really, uh, you know, it just, it it really rubs me wrong. I yes. just want to be a human, and that's that's all. And yes. when people start uh, talking about group identity, it just you know. the goal is to exactly get over that. But Matt, I think you need to distinguish between group identity by deliberate assertion and choice, and group identity forced upon people and peoples uh, beyond their control. I mean, well, the, and the Jewish yes. experience uh, is, a, is a bit unique in this sense in that it was a disparate group of people who viewed themselves as being Polish or German or French or British um, who were forced by circumstance to be defined as a Jewish nation um, through exclusion, through, through purges and so on. I mean, it was interesting living in Germany to realize both about Germany and Poland in the 20th century before the 1930s, that the national culture of both Germany, it wasn't like there was Germany and there, was, there were Jews in Germany. Jewish culture, German culture was Jewish culture. Um, <laughs> And until the 1930s. I mean, so much of it was. 
um, philosophically, musically, politically, everything, and true, and in Poland as well, um, that uh, the 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 violence of the cultural exclusion created a people who had to who had to self define, and I would say that in terms of the current you know overheated debates about racial theory, I think the basis behind a lot of this stuff is that you do have African-American populations who were forced to be black as an identity by outsiders, not necessarily with their will. It was not, it wasn't the identity you have. Now, I don't want to really get into that debate now that's become sort of inter, an intergenerational debate about whether people should embrace and, and take on identities that were imposed upon them by racists. I'll give you a little example. We recently won a little argument with the with the style guide editors of the Globe and Mail to spell anti the word anti-Semitic without a capital S. Um, because the, the notion of Semites being, which was a euphemism for Jews from the 19th century based on linguistic mythology was created by racists, right? I mean, anti-Semitism is the, the, the word that exists for Jew hatred, but the, the concept of a Semite is a racist concept. It was invented by racists. So we argued that to capitalize the S uh, gives false reality to a mythic concept. And I su suspect for a lot of Jews, for a lot of Black Americans and so on, it becomes a matter of, for a lot of Muslims in the world, it becomes a matter of, this is, may, may not be the thing I want to be, but it's, but it's, the, it's the identity that, it, that the world has forced upon me. And do I make the most of it or do I try to dodge it? Uh, I, don't, I would, uh, I sympathize with your position because uh, I don't uh, use the term and I, I would dissociate, you know, from critical race theory on the basis that it's using the term race. You know, race it doesn't exist. It's a 19th century concept uh, uh, that uh, was used as a synonym by the imperial powers, colonial powers to mean nation. Let me just say where I'm coming from. I mean, the, almost the day I was 18 years old, I moved into an interracial co-op in Berkeley, California. And it was in those days in 1949, that was a bold thing to do. And everybody I knew in that organization, I've stayed in, in touch. And, and it was always the goal was to get over race, not to try to you know, make it into a, a, a system for fighting a war or a conflict or defending or anything. It was like trying to pretend we didn't notice the difference between different, different, you know, races. And, and I still believe that that's the way to go. And I can't help it. That's just, and all of the blacks that I was friends with then and remained friends with the rest of my life, have the same view. As a matter of fact, so would Martin Luther King. I think he would be horrified by uh, the position that are, that's being taken as a way to fight against racism. It's, you know, the rate of fight about, against racism is to, you know, overlook race. Well, there's... can I just say we need to have an interview with Meta about living in an interracial, a multiracial co-op in 1949 in Berkeley. I did not know that aspect of your, your biography. Okay. Not to interview you at length about that, not to mention all the other things that happened to you in Berkeley over the next couple of decades. Yeah. yeah. There's two methods of overcoming the problematic that Meta has presented. Okay. There's assimilation, which I think is the name of the proposition that you're making. And there is dual identity. Dual identity is possible because a person can have the national identity of two different entities. One, the country in which they're living in as their homeland, and two, the national minority from which they are derived from and from which uh, they are labeled. Assimilation, on the other hand, has not worked historically. One example, in Spain, before 1492, the Jewish uh, people in Spain actually converted to being Catholic in order to assimilate. But this was not accepted after 1492, and they were either executed or expelled by Queen Isabella. Two, 
German Jewish assimilation, which was very advanced, was suddenly cut off and rejected as a dual identity, even though the Jewish identity was restricted to the domestic location, to the, to, to the home. You could be uh, Jewish at home, but you couldn't be Jewish outside of the home. This assimilation also has failed with the Nazi extermination campaign. Well, okay, look, it depends on what you mean by assimilation. If you look at the rate of intermarriage, um, is that assimilation? Uh, there's, okay, well, I don't know then. I've met plenty of families in, in, in Israel and, and West Bank who are, who, are, who are mixed, who are both Jewish and, and Muslim. Um, and or or various combinations involving Christian, Jewish, and Muslim. Well, how do they fall into this system? The children have assumed a dual identity. So in effect, it means an augmentation of the Jewish American community and not a diminution of the Jewish American community, but it is an identity that is not the same as before. I use a uh, I use a, an analogy or a metaphor to describe this, because if you consider a national identity, a national culture to be like a river with a flowing stream of water. Now, the river is always the river, but the water is never the same. The national identity always exists, but in each generation, it changes. National identity is not static. And a dual identity is one aspect of this changing national identity. I mean, I would argue that even for specific individuals, you have a different culture at different points in your life. Um, I, I was pointing out that my, somebody that my, my, my grandfather's culture was as alien to, to mine as somebody in Riyadh is, is to me. And in fact, it's very similar in terms of certain aspects of roles of men and women and so on. Um, that said, in nuts and bolts terms under your no state proposal, somebody who was of mixed identity, who governs them? Oh, in the resolution 181, there's a, there's a paragraph there that pointed out by Dr. Ray Davis that says that uh, Palestinians and Jewish people living in the land can adopt the uh, citizenship of either the Palestine uh, political authority or, or the uh, is, Israeli political authority. So it, it doesn't matter where they live. But it, or both? Can you have no, dual no. citizens? No. Okay. No to adopt you know, Palestinian citizenship. And they would vote in the Palestinian election, even though they were living in Israel. And My Israel. solution is, I want everybody to adopt both. I want to be, I, I'm, I'm an American and Canadian. And if I could also be Israeli and Palestinian and a few other things, I would do it. And I think that would be the best solution of all. Okay. No. Aaron's gone. I don't know what happened to Aaron, but and we never got Adam. So it's going to be. A, but I think the title of this show may be something like the one state solution. I mean, the no state solution. Thank you for taking the time to outline your thinking on this, Abraham. It was it was it was a uh, it was a pleasure. This is a rather rare opportunity that uh, I should congratulate Meta for. Thanks Thank so you, much, Meta. both of you. Thank okay, you. take care. Bye.